Good evening. I'd like to welcome everyone to the Algonquin uh, Regional School Committee meeting of Wednesday, October 19th, 2022. Calls into session at 6.33. And uh, just before we start the business of the meeting, I'd like to, it's a very exciting night um, and we have some special recognitions. So I'd like to turn it over to Principal Bevan. Yes, sure. Well, thank you, everyone, and it gives me great pleasure to, to invite you all. You're welcome to stay for the full meeting, everyone, but uh, <laughs> we're going to start off by the most fun part, which is to recognize our National Merit Commended Scholars, and we have a semifinalist as well. So I'm going to uh, announce your names. If you can come up, I have a small certificate for you, and um, we'll celebrate that moment. And if you head back to your chairs after that, we're going to have some cake. So let me get started over here. So for those of you who don't know, our National Merit Scholar uh, students, the commended students are students who finished in the, some of the very top scores in the country for the PSATs. Uh, only roughly 30,000 students in the whole country received this honor of the many uh, hundreds of thousands of students who, who take that exam. So uh, we're excited to, to celebrate the following folks. So um, I apologize if I, uh, if I announce somebody who's not here. Our RSVP list is a little bit incomplete. Elliot Fang. Okay. Joe Balsam. Mm -hmm. Joe's here. Congratulations. Maybe one of you stay here, maybe I'll do a photograph after. Um, Caleb Holland. Cameron Jackson. <laughs> Noah LaBelle. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Amy Lee. Nicholas Martel. Isabel McNulty. Frederick Probst. Jonathan Roberts. Shivnath Shankar. Shan Tang. Lula Utschneider. <laughs> Elena Westfall. <laughs> Henry Zhao. And our semifinalist this year is Madeline Jang.
We vote to accept them but retain them. Okay. Uh, we'll vote to accept the executive session minutes and retain those until they're released. Uh, the minutes for September 21st, uh, 2022. So moved. Second. Oh, Aaron and Karen. All in favor? Motion passes. Um, educational policy, we have done at this time. Uh, new business. Legislative update, Superintendent Martin. Sure. So, just a quick update. We did receive notice from the Operational Service Di Division, which is responsible for set setting out of district tuition rates, um, that they are expecting a 14% increase for fiscal year 24. So, that is a, a substantial increase, one that I feel um, we really can't sustain as a community and as a district. We will be partnering with our um, fellow communities in advocating to our legislative dele delegation that that is not something we can sustain uh, in the future. Just as an example, 14% of our out-of-district tuition cost is equivalent to about $300,000 on as an impact on our overall um, out-of-tuition budget, so it is significant. Um, so we're watching it very closely and we will be uh, advocating where we can. We are drafting a letter um, to submit to our legislative delegation, and I will have the chair sign on our behalf. Is there any talk of increasing, like, circuit breaker? There has been conversations around <coughs> using circuit breaker as one mechanism to offset the increase. So, um, in the past, when we've had not the specific issues, but these kinds of issues, and they always do seem to revolve around special ed costs skyrocketing. So uh, at the time when I was particularly appalled by special ed transportation, um, it really, really does help to actually face-to-face -face talk to your legislators. So if in Southborough we used to have, you know, they come in for coffee hours or for office hours, whatever they call them, I'm sure they do the same thing in Northborough. If you see them, and you can make it. It absolutely makes all the difference in the world to go there and tell them. Because at one point, you know, our representative was saying to me, you're the only one I'm hearing this from. And I said, ask around. <laughs> and she did. And it made a big difference. So um, I, I, highly, uh, I highly suggest that, especially because it seems like we're getting new ones or newly reelected ones, so they're maybe energized to take the opportunity to give you. That's a great point, yeah. They only hear what they hear. Yeah. Any other comments? Um, the MASC Mass Joint Conference, I, I don't know if um, anyone is interested in going to the conference. And I believe Kathleen Howland has registered for um, the Thursday, which I believe is the third. Mm -hmm. um, however, I don't think we've appointed a, a delegate. Um, I would just, I would just note that if the Northboro Southboro Regional School Committee does not appoint a delegate, it does not mean that we lose an opportunity to lobby for um, the resolutions. This is a very slow-moving process, and just the start of a long, multi-year um, process to actually see these types of initiatives and resolutions come to fruition. So um, I know that the, the MASC conference is evolving, and I believe before the pandemic, where they were getting to was to a place where if you registered, uh, every one of their um, sessions was videotaped. And so as a registrant, you had access to all of the different sessions which is highly valuable. So even if we don't send somebody for the whole thing, I'm asking, I'm not suggesting, that it might be valuable to have a registration so that we could at least have access to the, uh, you know, the session. Because there's a lot of really great information. And I'm, and I'm sorry I can't go, but I can't go this year. Would you be able to find that? I think if we... Um, we can register Kathleen because she's attending. Oh, the other Okay. Yes. 
<laughs> He's like, is he listening? <laughs> um, we can register Kathleen Powell in for all of the, the days, and that way we'll have access. Oh, that'll be good. And can all of us have access to it? Um, next is approval of grants and donations. We have a couple this time. <clears throat> this is two meetings in a row. Yeah. yeah. Paul's uh, really disappointed he's no longer <laughs> a member. <laughs> so I'll, um, I'll let Principal Bevan kind of share the donations that were received. Yes, sure. So first we um, I'm asking for the committee to kindly accept the donation from Avidia, a charitable foundation that Ben here, tirelessly, always looking to help offset the, the cost of our winter ball. We've approached a variety of organizations, and Avidia has committed $200 to the student council for that purpose. And additionally, we also, I don't know if we need to vote on that one and then the next, or um, I can tell you about the other. Um, yeah, why don't we take them one at a time? So um, I think you discussed that last time uh, I needed help with the winter ball, so it's nice to see more uh, contributions coming in. Are there any questions? <coughs> we have a motion to accept. Paul? I'll move that we accept the uh, contribution of $200 from the Avidia Charitable Foundation to the ARS, ARHS Student Council. Second. Matt, so I'll say it. All in favor? Adam Passes. And additionally, um, a member of, uh, North, of our Northbrook community um, has d kindly donated $500 in lumber to our applied arts department, specifically Mr. Arabian, who's our <coughs> wood technology teacher. Um, that's very generous and helpful. Uh, a motion to accept <coughs> that? I just have a question before. Oh. Is there a specific need? Is there a specific project, you know, that he reached out for? Um, I don't think Mr. Arabian approached him. I think okay. there's a member of the community who had high quality lumber and the cost of lumber has gone up significantly so all the projects that they're doing and and the timeline for getting those is, is done okay, up as well so i don't have details but i think those are, that's my impression okay um i'll make a motion then to um approve the lumber donation from mr peter miller miller um for approximately 500 dollars to the applied arts department second and uh, so all in favor so that passes. Thank you. Thank you both uh, to Avidia and to uh, Peter Miller for contributing to the the students here. Um, it really does take more than just us to support all the students. So thank you. Um, the distribution of department presentation schedule. So from the last um, schedule, we just made one change. We were anticipating that the fine and performing arts department would present this evening, but we tried to balance out the agenda topics, so they will be presenting in November, so we pushed them out a month. Sorry, I was looking across. I, okay, it goes down. Yeah. Any questions on that agenda or anything that people... Let's see. Okay, thank you. Uh, next is the superintendent's report. Sure, so I will, before I turn it over to Principal Bevan, um, I just will summarize. He'll um, share his typical principal's report, but also will present the Algonquin Regional High School um, School Improvement Plan Action Plan for 22-23, and also provide an overview of some of the accomplishments that took place last year. Last year was the first year of the plan's imp implementation, um, and the goal is each year to revise the plan, um, relook at the action steps, and update those accordingly. So that's what will take place this evening. And with that said, I will turn it over to Principal Bevan. Sure, thank you, Mr. Marno. So um, since the since we had the our event but at the start of this, the recognition of our National Merit Scholars and the principal's report um, primarily will be the school improvement plan because it's pretty, it's a little bit dense and, and pretty wordy. So. I'll try and keep it short. Uh, the other two things that are worth mentioning that let me um, let me start sharing. There we go. All right. Um, are that this year, as you know, we are in the middle of a new <coughs> bell schedule, which we covered uh, with some detail last week. We continue to, to um, monitor for how students are responding to that and staff. 
And in November, we're spending a staff meeting looking at how staff members, what kind of best practices staff members are have developed to make the, the Bell schedule work uh, optimally in their classes so students are getting the best experience possible. So I think in November and December, we'll have achieved the rhythm that is, I think, uh, necessary to know if the Bell schedule is a good fit for us. So uh, I will continue to share with you um, details about that as, as, they, uh, uh, as they are pertinent. Additionally, and it doesn't really show up in our, in our um, school improvement plan action steps, but a lot of our year this year, you may, you may know, you may uh, not recall, uh, will be that we are being um, in the process of reaccreditation. So this year we are going into the collaborative conference year. So that means that we are developing a deep dive um, uh, self-reflection report over the course of the first six months of the school year that is presented to the faculty it's generated out of the faculty, but uh, pulled together in, in a finalized form, voted on by the faculty as, an, as a, a, an accurate reflection of what we're doing well and what we need to work on. And then um, we uh, have a collaborative conference in March where uh, members from the ASCA team comes and, and helps, us, helps us with that examination. This is all in preparation for in two years, we'll have the full-blown 10-year uh, uh, reaccreditation visit. So. A lot of that work this year has already begun, and so um, a lot of the work of the, uh, the school-based uh, leadership team, that's our department head team, has been working uh, toward those goals. Um, so it's not terribly glamorous, and it's not really pic picture-worthy, so usually I share some pic pictures, but a lot of the work of the last month have, have been around Bell schedule and about NEAS. All right. So um, it gives me pleasure to share with you our school improvement plan and where we are um, on the action steps for this year um, so the three big categories that uh, that uh, we're all tackling as a district are uh, empowering learners equity of opportunity and healthy and balanced learners and the way i think about that work is is those are all things that we are are, are specifying as high um, as high priorities in this year and in this three-year period uh, to achieve the kind of outcomes that that are outlined in our portrait portrait of a graduate so that work was accomplished a few years ago and we continue to spiral back to and, and reference back to that document. I don't have that document up here, but uh, I'll have the gears that you might be familiar with um, that, that kind of signify the, the categories that we really uh, prioritize when we are setting our, uh, our, our goals for this year and every year. Um, so the three categories, uh, I'll start with the first one. So the district objective is to implement instructional practices under empowering learners to uh, engage students in developing and demonstrating their knowledge and skills through rigorous innovative and relevant learning experiences um, and the initiatives that are kind of nested under there that we are targeting closely at the high school level are to give students opportunities to use technology to solve problems learn to communicate and what that actually looks like here at the high school is what's listed here um, let me go back a little bit it's to finalize, and this work has already begun uh, last year and, um, and is really finalizing this year, is to work on uh, identifying power standards under the digital learning and computer science standards to include um, and identify where in the high school those are taught and what classes, what departments. They're heavily concentrated in one department currently, and we're, we're looking to expand that uh, beyond, beyond the applied arts. That's primarily where those are being taught heavily. We're also, and this work has already begun and, and is really, um, uh, it, the, the goal is to operationalize what it, we're calling the DLCS toolkit. It's exactly what it sounds like. It's a, it's a resource for staff to learn how to best use digital learning and computer science tools in their classrooms, even if they're not a class that might be typically associated with digital learning and computer science. And then additionally, and this is a carryover from last year, our library uh, department, who's sensational by the way, is looking to uh, continue to assist students in the development of their research skills, uh, specifically in, uh, in the digital realm. And just I'll put these boxes up on each of these three large categories, give you a little bit of an update. Here we are in October. We're not waiting to, you know, to begin this work. Uh, I'll just give you a bit of an update. So the DLCS toolbox was published at the end of September by our uh, digital learning uh, team and teachers are examining that and looking for ways to incorporate that work into, uh, in, incorporate those tools into their work. Under the equity of, equity of opportunity uh, <laughs> category, uh, the district objective is to provide all students with uh, access to challenging and culturally responsive 
learning experiences that meet their individual needs. And under that larger objective, the district initiatives are to do what it says here, foster culturally responsive and inclusive communities and environments that provide equal access. And I think anyone who follows us on social media or goes to our events is aware of, of some of the events that you're seeing. We have one tomorrow night that uh, I think uh, fits exactly this kind of priority. And what that looks like here at the high school is that we're spending time, if you recall last year, it was the first year we had unified our common, we had created common mid-year and final assessments for our, uh, our courses, our light courses. And this year we're now we're taking that uh, you know, to the next level to start to ensure that uh, teachers are, are examining that student work, the student work that results to identify achieve, achievement gaps and also to surface uh, best teaching practices. Uh, additionally, we're working to implement the World of Difference program. That's through the uh, Anti-Defamation Anti League. That was a big success last year, and this year we're carrying that work forward. Um, one of the things I'm inter really interested in doing, and I'm on, on a subcommittee with the other administrators in the district in uh, North and Southboro, is to, to examine our building resources, and including our classrooms, to see how culturally responsive and inclusive those, uh, those things are. It's not just about the textbooks we choose. Sometimes it's about the posters that are on the wall, and you know, there's all kinds of things um, that we have in our buildings that communicate messages to students, and we want to ensure that those are uh, messages of, um, uh, of inclusivity. Additionally, we're looking to identify, identify barriers to opportunity for students that are um, in underrepresented populations. Um, and part of that work is to review the program of studies to see if there are you know, historical or kind of um, traditional barriers that we haven't examined uh, critically in a while or ever um, to see if there's anything that we can, uh, can or need to adjust um, with our program of studies to ensure that all, all of our students have the same uh, access to the same high quality instruction. Um, so an example of what's happening so far is the ADL uh, training sessions have already been completed and I've already kind of initialized the, the study, the program of studies work. And we have um, our, our staff meetings topics mapped out for the whole year and the the common, common assessments um, examination kind of best practice work will be at the February uh, staff meeting. So we have a strategic roadmap for the year that really just maps out all the things that you've heard about already and that you will hear about, and that's, those are just two of them. And then under healthy and balanced learners, that's the last broad category. Uh, the district objective is to priori prioritize social, emotional, and physical well-being of all of our students. And the two district initiatives are to develop and implement a coherent, systematic approach to social emotional learning and to develop a comprehensive approach to health education. And what that looks like here at the high school is what's here. Uh, to implement PD opportunities to support uh, CASEL, which is our framework for, for tackling uh, SEL and improving SEL experiences for our students. Uh, to implement an SEL screening tool, which we identified last year, piloted, um, well, we more than piloted it. We, uh, we implemented it um, to full scale here at the high school and uh, at the other school levels as well. This year we're doing it again. We've moved the timeline up a little bit further into December. We did it uh, in the spring last year. In December will allow us to, to make uh, more meaning and actually uh, respond to the data a little bit more um, with more action. Um, we'll also inventory health curriculum standards and coordinate to ensure that our health educators are doing what, what the standards are, require. And we're going to be looking at the Metro West Adolescent Health Survey results to see what actionable steps are required um, to make sense of that data. And finally, we're going to be examining the uh, impacts of the start time change from fall to, uh, to 2021. Um, and that, as you know, kind of overlays onto the fact that we have a bell schedule this year that has uh, rotations in it that um, we anticipate may have benefits. I think the bell schedule rotations could um, amplify the benefits of the later start time because it kind of spreads the wealth of, of those benefits across all of the classes, not just the first two classes of the day. That was not the intention of the bell schedule change, but I suspect that that will be one of the one of the um, one of the, the factors or one of the benefits that we see. So just some progress updates for so far. The SEL screener, like I said, is planned for December, and then we're waiting to see what the quarter one data on student achievement looks like which uh, to see how the bell schedule change and the um, late start time um, might 
might match up, uh, might deliver some benefits. We won't quite know. It's hard to tell currently. Okay. Um, those are the big, <coughs> excuse me, that's the, um, our whole school's plan in one very brief kind of uh, bulleted out uh, overview, but these are the big things we're targeting over this three-year period under the guidance of Superintendent Martineau and with all the other, all the other um, schools, and this is what it looks like here at the high school. Oh, open it up to the committee. Questions? Um, so I don't know if my question is for you or for um, the superintendent. The, um, the Metro West Health Survey, mm -hmm. I feel like we're, like do we, how often do we get those results? And I don't really feel like we always get, you know, to know exactly like what's in them. I don't feel like they're very, forthcoming with their information or whatever. Mm -hmm. So um, are you using it from a couple years ago? Or are we using it more, you know, a current one to really help with this? Sean, <laughs> yeah, I think I'd be Mary, happy to answer, I, but Mary Allen, Mary Allen's Allen's a good I, 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 just, well. I just always feel like this comes up in one of our yeah, So we, we received our um, results um, this past spring. From? Metro West. From last from year? Last year. Yes. Okay. okay. Correct. So, um, Mary Allen, I don't know if you want to speak to the committee work that you're doing with Jennifer Lipton O'Connor in the high school and how we're thinking about how to best communicate that information. I think in the past it's set with the Health and Wellness <coughs> Committee. Right. Um, and it was presented at that committee level, but it wasn't always shared with the larger community right. um, or the school committee. So, Mary Allen can share some of the ideas that we're thinking about. Sure, I was actually just at a meeting today um, with the EDC, <coughs> which is the group that puts out the Metro West Health you know, Survey to talk about ways to share it, better ways to get more people involved with it. But we um, we got our key indicators back in March or April of last year, and it was for 2021. So the survey was done right when the students started coming back to school. Um, after the pandemic. So okay. um, we have to take all the data and put that in mind when we're analyzing all the data. Um, and from what we saw from the key indicators, what we saw, that's why we did the parent webinars in June um, as a result of those key indicators. And then we got um, more detailed data this fall um, that we are just getting ready to analyze with our wellness committee, with our Substance Abuse Prevention Coalition, um, which is being rebuilt and yep. reorganized right now. So we're looking into that with um, the both the town's health departments, and we have an epidemiologist that will be looking into the data and comparing the data to see where we need to focus our efforts. When we're so when you had the parent webinars, how were they? Were there a lot of did a lot of parents attend them? Do you know or not? Um, I don't have that. The Jennifer Lipton O'Connor would have that information, okay. but we could get back to you. They are on the website still. We are planning, um, not sure if it's quarterly or monthly webinars for uh, speaker series or presentations for our parents and students, touching on all of the risk factors or the even the the positive supports that we have, you know, how can we, you know, beef up what, what's good, what, what's helping our students, the, the protective factors that they have. So um, that series is starting in November. We have our first speaker that's, that's Sean's been working on securing for us, and then we have the Wellness Committee is planning on finding two more speakers. The medical advisory team is working on finding some speakers, so there's a lot of different committees that are working together to to help support all of us and then, for, for our parents and our students we're looking at. And then can we have some, can like, can the health and wellness just come here and let us know about some of the stuff that was on that? I mean, I just feel like there's so many different places right now that are talking about mental health with kids. And I think it's such an important, you know, it's all, and it could be a lag thing, you know, yeah. between 2020 and now, you know, I just think it's. And I think it's one piece of data we have a lot of data that we could look at when we're trying to figure out what's, what would be best, the best supports for our students at the time, like Metro West is one section of data. We have our social emotional 
learning screening that was done. We have you know our attendance. We have our equity things. We have a lot of data that we take. So when we put all of those together, that will when we can sit down and really look at all of that data together to see okay. where we need to focus our efforts. But yes, we can definitely come okay. and present that. Thank you. So far, any other questions? Other questions, Kathleen? This is such a broad question, and I apologize. <laughs> but what is the general um, process for measuring if we're if we do all these things? <clears throat> are we are our students better off? Like, and we talked about a ton of data, but um, like each individual one of these is like, okay, that's great, ensure excellence. How do we know we're doing it? How do we know it's excellent? Is there is there some form of data, you know, sort of like before, or are we just assuming that you know, in terms of the cultural, you know, diversity, you know, kids aren't happy, they'll be happier later. I mean, like, how are, is there is there? I'm not even sure there's an answer to the question. Is there a way to measure all of these great initiatives? So I'll, I'll just speak to. Um, and Stephanie and Sean can add. I mean, I think we are developing key performance indicators to say, okay, how will we know when we have made incremental growth or, or um, improvements to those areas? Not all areas are, are easily um, indicated in terms of key and performance indicators, but that's some of the work that we're doing with our teaching and learning team and the department chairs to really identify what those are. I would add that uh, when I came on board, it was in the pandemic, but even pre-pandemic, some of we didn't have a lot of really great systems for, even frankly, for like classroom attendance here in the high school was very localized. Teachers kind of had their own way of doing it, and we came up with a unified system that was not terribly difficult to adopt, but it, there were some bumps in the road, and now we're starting to see you know, a really unified data set, not just on daily attendance, but on classroom attendance. I think it's just an opportunity you know, this is the first year where we really have a really robust data set and we can see which students aren't just making their way into the building, but which ones are making their way, you know, from every class, one class to another. And uh, a lot of that data, we want to make sure we're looking at students in subpopulations, um, you know, students of color, you know, who, who um, we, we want to ensure are having the best opportunity and that, that, that all of our students' attendance rates are, 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 are or what we want them to be, and now we have a much more granular opportunity to do that. That's just one example. I can also, you know, here's another example, the Metro West Health uh, Survey. I think this is the first time they're identifying the performance of subgroups in, in a lot of these things, and, um, a lot of these risk areas, and they can um, identify basically a, s a sense of belonging for students in, let's say, um, who are identifying as L LGBTQ+. Plus and whether or not they feel like they have the same sense of belonging to students who are not in that subpopulation. So I think you can comport some of that data to the attendance data, and mm -hmm. I don't think it's exactly a science yet we don't have it. It's still more of an art to try and make sense of all that. Um, but our systems are strengthening um, almost monthly to know which students are struggling and to comport that data against you know, things like attendance and things like our mid-year exams, we can now start to dis, um, disaggregate in ways that just simply didn't exist until we had common assessments. We didn't have common assessments until last year. We didn't have classroom uh, attendance until this year. So I think we're growing through these and not everything can be measured, but um, things that we can measure, we are not only measuring, but we're looking to identify how those, um, those things work together to, to reflect the experience of students with a specific focus on our students who are in subgroup populations that have historically struggled. And, and is the thinking when we, um, when we institute these systems, because <laughs> what always happens, right, is that, oh, five years from now, you'll get a new classroom mm -hmm. attendance system. And so then all the data from five years yeah. ago <laughs> is gone, or, or it can't be, you know. So is there some vehicle that you can um, encapsulate the trends so that you, five years from now can see what happened five years ago, and so therefore maybe X, Y, Z is, isn't working. Okay, can I ask a question? Is it panorama that's being used for the? So we do use panorama, um, not for the SEL, but for other administrative surveys. 
I think um, Dr. Reinhorn can speak to the system of data collection that we're trying to create that creates a historical um, picture of progress okay. and identifies those key performance <coughs> indicators. So what you're describing, I would say, is a, a challenge that districts across the country face. The businesses is, face them, absolutely. Yeah. Right, which is that we have a tremendous amount of data um, from a lot of different places, and uh, and we send data to DESI, DESI then gives data back to us, they put different pieces together, there um, are curriculum platforms that we use that give us data, there's Metro West Health, there's all of these different sources. And there's, um, we have been working to figure out how can we bring together all of these different data sources so that we can not only um, see them more readily and more easily, but then analyze them and use them and look at them over time. So we're actively talking to a few different vendors right now that are trying to solve this problem. And um, Julie Doyle and, and I actually were on the phone with someone yesterday and um, she's at a conference that she was at today and seeing some of the vendors that we have been investigating and seeing presentations from some districts that are using them. So it's a piece of work that we're excited about and hopeful that we can wrangle the data so that we can see it over time and also be able to put multiple pieces of data mm -hmm. together on the screen and say Metro West Health, mm -hmm. SEL screener, attendance. Mm -hmm. What's the story they all tell mm -hmm. together? Okay. So it's something we're working very hard on. I think our goal is to create a data dashboard that answers the question, are we making progress toward the outcome of the portrait of the graduate? Mm -hmm. you know, are we indeed um, you know, moving the student experience closer to making sure that all students leave Algonquin prepared for the world of work mm -hmm. or college or career? I guess the last thing I would say is that I just, that when I think about school improvement plans and strategic plans, um, implicitly they're always our best theory about how to get where we're trying to go, right? And so they're our best thinking and we have a theory of action and when we do it well, we're explicit about what our theory of action is, which is like if we're working on something like attendance or school start time, we have a theory <coughs> about if we change this, mm -hmm. then we believe it will have this impact on these outcomes. Mm -hmm. And then you try to measure the different outcomes along the way. And depending on whether you get the results you want, you then track yourself back and say, well, were we pushing on the wrong thing or were we measuring the wrong thing? And so that's what these plans are really all about, is us trying to explicitly say, these are the goals mm -hmm. and this is our best thinking about how to get there. And then you're asking exactly the right question, which is then how do we measure progress? Thank you. Can I follow up on that? Because that was one of the questions I had was around the um, staggered schedule, the bell schedule, and you said you were going to try to measure what effect that's had. My question was, how do you do that? Which yeah. I think gets back to what you were just saying. Yeah, but, absolutely. But, I mean, do we have a plan for that yet, or is this part of you know, the vendors that you're pursuing? But can I just add to, though, it's, it's making sure you're clear on what your outcomes are <coughs> before you make the change. So it's, it's saying, we're not making change for the sake of changing. Here are the outcomes we're trying to achieve. Here are the schedules that we think meet those outcomes, and, and then we choose the, the one that we think that best aligns. And then we collect student data, teacher data, <coughs> academic data around are we achieving the outcomes that we said we hope to accomplish. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's clear that when we move forward with an initi initiative, that we set the outcomes before of why and what are we hoping to achieve before we move. Um, and that's how we measure progress. To, you know, so it wasn't like Sean came into the district and said, I just, you know, I'm new here. Let's measure some stuff. People love it when, you know, you change the schedule. But in that particular yeah. example, yeah. I mean, I'm trying to think, what, what are you measuring against? So I can respond to that. Yeah. So in our old schedule, we had the first two blocks of the, of the day were, were uh, locked in and they, they didn't move. So students who perhaps uh, had a hard time getting into school on time or 
they just uh, were, you know, their brains weren't fully awake, and that's many of our teenagers, and the fact that you know, all teenagers bodies kind of are more optimal for learning later in the day. I anticipate that students' um, performance in periods one and two classes historically were probably lower than what this year will be periods one and two classes that are only periods one and two on one day of the cycle and they rotate freely through the rest of the day. Are you talking so about measuring the performance of specific students? I think we could, no, I think we could probably look at, we're looking to see, um, and uh, one of our assistant principals is tasked with this this year, to look at to see if there are quarterly averages and their, their, their scores on their mid-year final exams, which are now common across, and we're able to see if their period one, two performance is the same as identical cohort periods and the remaining periods of the day because now the new variable is that that period in one, one and two don't meet routinely and only from 7.30 to 9 a.m., which is what they did forever. And so that's like one example that could be pretty specific and you know, there's a, vari a variable we can isolate pretty closely and narrowly. Um, so I'm interested to see what it says. So things like uh, student attendance in those periods, um, their quarterly averages, and then their performance on mid year and finals. Those are just be three really pretty broad measures, but I suspect they would show us if there's a measurable difference. And there might not, but uh, they're very well made. And I'll just add to, you know, a major change in the schedule is the length of a block. Yes. So, you know, I think if you change the amount of time the teacher has, front of the students in terms of a class period. You know, the thinking is that evidence-based um, instructional practices come into play and what you can do in a longer block allows for more experiential, hands-on project-based learning, as an example. And it's very difficult to measure, yeah. but uh, in this year we do schedule because the blocks are longer because we're dropping a block that means one less passing time per day times 180 days, that does add up to something like 13 or 14 more hours of instruction over the course of the year. Now that's spread across all your classes, so that's a hard to measure, but that's a lot of instruction students are getting this year. Don't tell anybody, Ben, but uh, <laughs> a lot more than they were getting last year. I mean, it's really two school, school days, and one would think that that will have benefits, if only that they don't have the hustle and bustle of a, uh, one extra transition per day for the entirety of the whole school year. But again, hard to measure uh, yep. and hard to really pinpoint what the impact is on that work. Yep. All right, thank you. I think, thank you. I think to piggyback a little bit on the bell schedule thing, <clears throat> I'd be a little, I'd be curious, um, maybe Ben, you might be able to shed a little bit of light on this. A little anecdotal, perhaps, um, anecdotal evidence related to the later start time, how students generally feel about that. Um, and it, is it working, is it not working? And then I have a follow up for uh, Mr. Bevan related to that. The start time or the bell schedule? Or um, I'm more interested in the start time at the moment. So start time, I mean, personally, I really like it. Um, we also though, it's been so long that I don't really remember the 720 <laughs> high school starts because we haven't had it since my, we had, half of a freshman year, and then we went home, and then we came back yeah. <laughs> for half the time at 8 a.m., so I don't really know if I, people really can think about it right now that well anecdotally, because it's been three years of it, which is hard to think about, because um, we haven't had a 7.20 a.m. start since March 12th of 2020, because then we went to connect when we were meeting from like 10 to 1 or something. And, it was all over the place. But I think thinking about how alert people are if they come to like a club meeting that's at school at 7.20 or 7.30 versus walking into first period at 8 a.m., I think the difference is substantial. Um, and I think anyone, like it was said when it was originally put in, like people are going to bed at the same time either way. I don't think people are necessarily staying up 40 minutes later to try to like get the same amount of sleep. So I think people are getting more sleep and I think first period feels a lot more lively than I used to remember it being this year and kind of in general. Well, that's great. Um, I, th I think it's awesome. I think the later start time is important. I think shifting that day later is great. One of my concerns related to that, and it's what that means, perhaps when you're collecting data, um, I would be curious to see the difference between, if this is even a data point you're interested in collecting, 
the difference between students that are being dropped off at the start of the school day and the students that are being that are taking the bus. And the reason why I say that is because I know that I have students at the end of my street that are getting picked up at about five minutes of seven. And um, with the later start, I'm not sure if any of those students are high school students, but I know that my son gets either walks over or gets dropped off, and he gets here pretty close to the start of the school day. So um, most of the time he gets here pretty close to the start of the school day anyway. And um, so I'd be curious to see if, there, if, if there's a noticeable difference, especially from the perspective of equity, in terms of students that are able to be dropped off at a later time yeah. versus those that are actually waking up earlier to uh, get the bus. So. I would say I'd be interested in seeing that data. I think collecting it would be a challenge because not knowing always who gets dropped right. off. And certainly we know who rides the buses and we can know who rides a parking pass. So there are data sets we can, we can access there. And, um, but I, I, if there's a way to measure it and, and make it some kind of meaningful Sensitive. Yeah, sensitive. Yeah, sensitive. What I would add too is that it's when was that bus on the road pre G. Mm -hmm. yeah, so that, that same bus was on the road at 610. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it's, um, but it is important to, to look. I do think that when students gain their license, um, that their arrival time is much later. They take advantage of it. That's right. Yes. Thank you. If I can add one thing with the start time, the only kind of, not necessarily negative, but downside that I think people have noticed is the 2.30 to end of school day to start of practice is a lot shorter of a period of time than when we ended at 1.50. So I think a lot of clubs are finding it difficult to meet after school um, because like athletes who have to be at practice at 3, have to be in the locker room at 2.45, don't have much time after school. But I also think coaches have been very flexible with that, and I acknowledge that, but that's kind of the one thing that I know people have complained about with the new start time. Ben, have you heard of any, or have you heard of any uh, clubs or teachers that are starting their clubs before school and running a club, say, half an hour before school starts? I think only the student council. And that's all, <laughs> and that, has, that has been our practice going back 15 years. So the various honor societies are hours before school starts, I can tell. Yeah, and uh, what is happening certainly is some teachers are having extra help early, you know, before school than after, you know, more than after school to make sure. So when I'm here very early, there it's not uncommon for students to show up at seven or seven fifteen, and more often than not, they're there to meet a teacher to get extra help for you know whatever reason. Um, so we have the doors accessible by students that put themselves uh, enter them, get themselves into the building without having an adult do that for them after set, beginning at 7 a.m. because of that. It started at 7.30 and that just, for too many kids who wanted to be here for that. But I would say that lots and lots of kids, but that's a mutually beneficial really, arrangement for teachers who can't stay late and uh, who still want to provide that extra help. Great, and kudos to those teachers and students yeah. that do make that initiative right. to come in the morning to get that home. Thank you. So, interesting, at first I thought I had a something unrelated, but now I'm seeing how it's related. Um, so I, this may just be a request for next meeting, because I got a, um, an inquiry from a resident last evening that was interested in the presentation on the uh, fine and performing arts, mm -hmm. um, and trying to figure out, is it on tonight's agenda or, or next time? And where I think the, the question ties in is in the area of equity and opportunity. The question she had related to, apparently, athletes, um, and folks that want to participate in the program have to make a decision. Either you do sports or you do performing arts, and they thought that was unfair. So I thought maybe they could just speak to what, how that works. Is there any opportunity to create access or you know, equity and opportunity to students that would be willing to do both, whether it be in a limited capacity or something else? And I thought it tied in. And then it's interesting about you know, how it's impacting clubs as well. So. Mm -hmm. I can do my best to gather that. Well, then you might and be able to talk about a lived experience. Yeah, I think it's certainly, I, I personally don't play an instrument. I help with, in a logistical capacity with the musical, so I know some context from that, but I'm not like cast in it. But I know there are lots of kids who participate in the bands that meet after school um, and are also on sports teams, and it's, it's difficult, but it's doable. Um, 
and I think both the musical department and the coaches are kind of willing to work with each other on it. So like I know one of my buddies on the cross country team like missed practice yesterday for rehearsal and the coach was okay with that and then the director of the conductor I guess of the band is aware that some days you might miss rehearsal because you have a meet or a game and I think the most important thing in all of these situations where like time is kind of the issue is students advocating for themselves um, and kind of talking to whatever adults may be involved and I think once they've made that contact everyone is very flexible as long as it's not abused um, so I, I think though it's definitely doable I wouldn't say it's definitely like you're either an athlete or a musician you're either an athlete or you're in this club um, it just requires a certain sense of self-advocacy to do it and I think that's something that when kids come to the student council with like we're having trouble with this we often say like have you tried talking to them and oftentimes that solves the issue without having to make any major steps. That kind of leads into our next topic. Are we any more questions on the school improvement plan? I mean, that's a lot of detail and a lot of work, and it's multi-year work too. Yeah. So that leads us right, so right into yeah. athletics. It was perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Do I wait and comment? <laughs> I, I mean, to go back to the original point, I think our coaches do a fantastic job working with our teachers and our directors and have the ability to work with both um, arts and with athletics. And I can recall a couple of years ago, we've actually worked with uh, the department and uh, rescheduled the game around uh, a concert that was taking place so everyone could attend. So I think they do a good job with, you know, allowing the students to either miss a practice to go to an event or, um, or vice versa. So. Um, there is opportunity, I think Ben said this, to do both. So, um, and we will always be there. We're willing to work with the arts uh, department as well to, and make changes where necessary so we can work together. You got my, okay, all right. Well, first of all, thank you everybody for, uh, for allowing me to come here tonight. And uh, as the norm with uh, Algonquin Athletics, our student athletes continue to represent their school and communities with outstanding performances on and off the field. Um, it's hard to believe that uh, we are approaching the end of fall. It goes by really quickly. Um, so to kind of to begin, uh, we had close to 400 athletes participating this fall. Actually, it was about 398 to be exact. And at this time last year, we had uh, about 412. So our attendance right now is a little bit even, just down about 12 student athletes, even though our enrollment is, is down a little bit. Um, our stu uh, three student ambassadors for our athletic council leadership team, which is uh, Katie Cullen, Zachary Meal and Catherine O'Connell will participate in our lead and MIA leadership workshops throughout the year. Uh, we have one coming up next week uh, that's going to be talking about leadership and culture and fan behavior um, that we'll be attending in Marlboro. And their first MIA leadership workshop will be um, at um, November 10th at Gillette Stadium. Uh, it's called the MIA Leadership Summit, where, um, where up to three student athletes are able to participate across the whole state, attend Gillette Stadium, and go through leadership workshops. Um, our, um, in then our athletic council and our leadership team, uh, we've had two meetings thus far. Ben has been a part of it as a representative uh, for uh, Boys Cross Country. Uh, these meetings included uh, all fall team captains, our team representatives for the lower levels. Uh, players participate um, in group work and focused on leadership. And some additional topics that we discussed were uh, being comfortable with uncomfortable conversations with not only their peers but with their coaches. Um, handling hard well, which leads us into overcoming adversity. Um, and we talked about the roles of being a team leader and a, being a great teammate and making good decisions on and off the court. Um, then hopefully have some positive feedback from our two uh, sessions so far. Um, and I think it's great we're also developing an acronym for uh, Titans because we did this about two years ago for the acronym of uh, Captains, which we came up with was uh, Communication, Attitude, Perseverance, teamwork, aspiration, um, integrity, and non judgmental, and sacrifice. And so, we're going to be working on and we'll continue to have dialogue about coming up with uh, uh, an acronym for Titans. Um, our NLI Day, which is our National Letter of Intent Day, will be held on uh, Wednesday, November 9th. And this is this year will be, again, as we do in every single, every, for the previous years, we're recognizing our athletes who have the opportunity to further their academic and athletic career at the collegiate level. Um, 
ARHS earned uh, the 2021 and 22 MIA Sports Music Honor Roll recognition for not having any student athletes or coaches disqualified. Uh, this is the back to back year for 2021 and 2022, also had it in 2020 and 2021. Our boys and girls uh, soccer teams are nationally recognized for the second year in a row uh, for, by the United Soccer Coach Association for winning a team academic award for their exceptional academic performances in the classroom. Our Hall of Fame is back for the first time after three years, uh, which is great, and we're very, very excited. Intended to be scheduled for Friday, November 25th, um, ARHS Athletics will induct five new members of the class of 2022, which includes our 1979 boys varsity basketball team, uh, uh, Allison Hay, a former soccer, lacrosse, and track standout, class of 2006, Tom Bernazzi, class of 667, He's a former coach, basketball. He's my former coach, actually. Um, Chris DeBello, football, track, and field. He was a uh, class of 1986. Kevin Brown, uh, football, basketball, and baseball, class of 2009. Um, James McHugh was track and field, class of 1979. And Mr. John Healy, a longtime supporter of the athletic department and former girls lacrosse coach, were receiving the 2022 Spirit Award. Uh, the Athletic Hall of Fame, which was established in 1999, has previously inducted many outstanding individual student athletes and several championship teams from Algonquin. And it's an honor from the Athletic Department, the RHS Student Athletic Council, and the Hall of Fame Committee to present the 2022 inductees. Um, just a quick recap of where we stand now with our fall, uh, with our fall records and achievements thus far. Our girls soccer is ranked eight in the state with an eight oh and six record our boys soccer team sits at three nine and three and preparing to play in our central mass playoffs which i'll begin for our sports team next week um volleyball is 11 and six just got a big win tonight versus uh, shepherd hill and they're ranked 16th in the state field hockey uh has a five nine one record and ranked 22 in the state and uh our top 32 hopefully we have the ability for those sports teams they finish in the top 32 they'll make the the state playoff tournament which starts in November 4th, I believe. Golf uh, finished the season with a 9-7 record and placed third in our league championship and finished 10th in the MIA state sectionals. Both boys and girls cross country had great regular seasons in league competition and competed in multiple invitationals across the straight, across the state, sorry. Uh, the cross country league championship meet is on 10-22. It's our Midwatch league championship meet. Uh, cheerleading starts their competition schedule next Saturday. Uh, Unified Basketball started their regular season schedule. They had a great game today versus Shrewsbury. And in a few weeks, Unified Basketball will participate in our league jamboree. And the MIA State Jamboree will be held at Algonquin Regional High School on November 16th. Uh, lastly, football is sitting at 1-5. However, they uh, continue to work hard and overcome some early, early season adversity. And I'm looking forward to hosting West, uh, Westboro on Thanksgiving Day for the first time in three years. Um, I don't know if you want to switch the slide. Or yep. Yeah, uh, and the the next the, the next yeah. slide is really about uh, the uniforms and, and the, uh, we were asked for an update on how uniforms are being replaced. So uh, maybe before if there are any questions about all the it's a lot of information before we get into the uniforms, which is all right, I read fast. So me and Principal Bevan uh, worked on sort of a uh, request to have a sort of a uniform update. I gave a brief update at the end of last year in June, but uh, sort of this, a, a better visual, better roadmap of sort of where we stand uh, going into this year. Uh, our typical replacement for our uniforms um, would be the 67 years, um, and our sub varsity teams uh, would always inherit those retired uniforms. So the varsity would get new uniforms, those varsity uniforms would go down to JV1, and then the JV1 uniforms will go down to JV2. Uh, we have started the cycle. But it actually started about two years ago. Um, and uh, I think it was one of the first conversations I had with Principal Bevan about two years ago about maybe the anticipation of the mascot change. Uh, we just put a pause on new uniforms about three years ago because of COVID. And then going into the following year, uh, we had a conversation about uh, the potential of needing the uniforms due to a mascot change. So we actually started this cycle a year before uh, the new mascot was approved, which was back in April. And in that, in that instance, just to remind you, Mike, or the members, uh, we continue to buy uniforms. We just chose yep. language that was neutral and could be used if the mascot w was changed or was not and wouldn't delay us further out by a year. So that year, we just simply ordered 
uniforms that had Algonquin on them and not uh, Tomahawks. Uh, and so that, I think, afforded us. We ended up a bit farther along in the replacement cycle by about a year than we would otherwise have been. Yeah. So, um, so where we stand right now, you can see what's been replaced up to fall of 2022, which is where we stand now. You can see that we have our cheerleading, our ski team, uh, which is uh, our girls varsity soccer our, uh, field uh, hockey team, which is varsity boys and girls tennis team, and boys cross country. Um, where we stand going into this year, uh, that's on the cycle, um, we have girls lacrosse, boys track, wrestling, boys varsity soccer, and actually missing in there with girls uh, cross country and girls track also, but have gotten new uniforms this year as well. Um, through boosters, and I say through boosters is because boosters has been instrumental in the transition. Um, they've done a fabulous job of fundraising, and this is always, fundraising for new uniform has always been a, a, an option. Uh, they go out, they work hard to generate their money, and on top of that, uh, uniforms has always been an option to purchase, uh, especially if they wanted to move up in the six, from the six to seven year cycle. If they wanted to go earlier, they knew that they would be able to purchase their own uniforms through booster funds. On top of uniforms that are boost, uh, purchased, they're also purchasing uh, team gear, equipment that might be needed. So uniforms is not something new this year that they've, they've uh, purchased. However, it's just another uh, item that is available to them if they did not want it to wait their turn in the rotation. So with that being said, uh, we had our boys uh, varsity basketball and our girls varsity basketball are purchasing new uniforms and moved up in rotation. And our football team uh, was able to purchase the uniforms through boosters going into this new fall season. And then the three year rotation that we have left up is the 2023 and 24. We have girls varsity ice hockey, girls JV volleyball, Varsity baseball, softball, and varsity volleyball. Um, and then, as you can see, our 24 and 25. And then, I guess the, the biggest question mark and what we're going to have to continue to work with as we work through the budgets each year uh, to stay, make sure we're staying within our budget and we're not going above is that we have to, because of the rotation, what the status quo has been over the last six or seven years, we're going to have to work in the lower levels um, with the anticipation that our lower level teams may be still having tomahawk issued a tire for the next two to three years, but I think it has accelerated a little bit than what we originally approved, which was a, you know, a five to six year plan. Questions? Yeah, I hope I answered Thank it. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Well done. All right. Yeah, no, that's awesome. I don't know if we'd like to girls ice hockey, we, we yep. share with other schools, so we do. they contribute costs too, I would assume. We do, we have it split up between ice time, yes, and uh, officials. We have, it's, it's a good system that's worked with our five other schools that we have. We don't embrace 100% of the cost, we have it split. Yeah. Yep. Do we have any other teams that are shared? We have a uh, co-op with Westboro for boys rugby, uh, but we are the home school. Um, and we have a co-op that uh, we for girls golf with Westboro, yep. yep. and they are the home school. Yeah, I, I would just add that without the boosters and the help of our parents and community, I, I think you know the students would we'd be looking at older gear for a longer period of time, and students have a high interest in wearing kind of something that really represents the school that they play for. And so I think this has, the, I think it was a fair question that there's that, that, you know, how are we, that, how is this happening? And I think this, I hope, I'm hopeful that this yeah, is do it, next time of answering it. I think the boosters have, whereas they might be diverting the, using their funds to pay for gear or equipment that in another year, we're diverting that more to accelerating the. Well, we're thing. informed people always ask. They ask, yeah. It's always, very you know, you know, you'd be sitting there and saying, oh, uh, what about the uniform? Yeah. You know? And it's like, oh. So. And, then, and it's a little bit, it's, it's, it's uh, I wish I had one easy answer, but yeah. something, for example, like football, the uniforms are now made in the material and for a process that they're quicker to, to purchase and much cheaper than they've ever been. If you've seen the uniforms, they don't have that tackle twill, which is like literally stitched on. It's like almost like a printed fabric. It's, you know the name for it. I Screen can't printed, yeah. Um, and so that product is much cheaper. And so the boosters, instead of spend, spending $30,000 to outfit the football team, is spending much, much less. So they can accelerate it much faster than they would have if this were five or 10, 15 years ago. Yeah. 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 Y
Great. So it's not an apples to apples kind of comparison. Mm -hmm. each, each one of these, uh, each one of these did take deliberation and thoughtfulness and boosters input and 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 that. Does it wear just as well? Oh yeah, yeah. The last the screen printing is on ninety percent of our uniforms now. Don't wear they don't wear off. It's, it's actually it's supplemented inside. Yeah. The, it's supplemented. It's actually not screen printed it's on like the fabric. It's like the ink is like pumped into the yeah. fabric. So it's yeah. just the fabric. no peeling. Yeah. Yeah. And it just well, lasts longer and holds up. Yeah, we could not thank Boozies enough for how it's been wonderful. The support yeah. they are, and I think too, uh, just to highlight, I think uh, our students are embracing uh, the new logo, the new mascot, quicker than you know, which is great to see, and I think that uh, they're excited about the opportunity to wear. And represent the Titan logo earlier than maybe what they might yeah. be on the rotation, Good. so which is great to hear too. Yeah, it's hard to believe it was only February that we February, identified right, April. Titan yeah. or April last year. <laughs> then when it was, yeah, it's been really nice to see. So yeah, the football team was excited. Yeah, was, uh, was Coach Cahill put together a nice video. With, uh, oh, it's great. When he unveiled them all at one of the pasta nights, I think it was. Yeah, I will say football in particular. The coaching staff is, is really. Um, a really great group that has led the way in, in, um, in adopting the Titans, but also just setting a tone for the building. Yeah. You know, they're struggling this year, and it's been a tough year in a lot of ways. They've done a nice job of keeping, you know, keeping uh, or kind of promoting the Titan as a, as a, a mass staff this year. And all of our teams have done a nice job. The whole senior class, and I'll give Ben credit here, the, uh, the senior class has really set a nice tone for the year. This is a big year in transition with the mascot alone, and we don't even think about it because they've set up really great. Sure. I just had one question. If it would be possible for Greg to uh, send a copy of this slide to us, because just as you were mentioning at games, it was mentioned at the North Third Town meeting. Yeah. Okay. So it, I was trying to take notes, but yeah. <laughs> it didn't work. I was trying to do short end here. So if you could, Greg, if you could get that slide yeah. to us and just so that we have it, it would be very helpful. Absolutely. I will update it. We're missing two. I tried to. All right, so Mike, why don't I have yeah. you update it, and yeah. then once that's done, I'll give it to, I'll send it to Greg, yeah. and then Greg will have it. Oh, perfect. Share with okay. Thank you. Fantastic. And thanks for your um, for your <coughs> update on this. This is wonderful. Absolutely. And every time you, you come, it's very valuable. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for your enthusiasm. Love Thank my you. job. <laughs> <laughs> Can I just ask you to comment on impact testing? Really briefly. Oh. <laughs> uh, sorry. Yeah. I actually was going to pop in there because yes, we've had some. It's been a tough, tough year for. Uh, a lot of some of our athletes through uh, injuries, a lot, a lot of football teams, not only being career threatening injury, however, concussions has been a real, uh, real impact this year, pun intended. Uh, we are working on the impact testing. Uh, we are just uh, up to date now, we are close up to 100. I would just like to say that uh, the impact testing is recommended to take it once every two years. So we were going and working with anyone who did not take the test last year. Um, but also we're highly recommending that everyone take it again, even though it's, you know, it's not required. Uh, we are recommending that even though you don't have to take it for every two years, we're trying to work with our teams to take it every year. Um, but we are, we're mainly focused with our incoming freshmen or any students who did not take the test at the beginning of last year. Um, and then we'll continue to work with our winter athletes and then into our spring and have a, a report at the end of the year. If that's. You can be Paul Buckeye for like the rest of the year. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just, again, want to applaud the coaches and you know, taking time during practice to really make this a priority through Mike's leadership. I think it has made a difference. Looks good from like two to yeah, I think 100 or something. Yeah. Very we had 500 athletes taking last year, which yeah. is the most it's awesome. been. So it was, wow. I think, like three and four years, years ago, though, it was probably a handful. Yes. I think all we have two is our athletes. We increase, but it went from two to four. <laughs> <laughs> and I think, too, what we're seeing now is that uh, families are reaching out to us to take uh, the post test, too, as well, after they sustain a concussion and having their licensed health care provider read and evaluate. Can I add one thing? <coughs> Another kudos to Coach Allen, the football yeah. team, who went out and bought a whole bunch of those things they put over the helmets, I forget what you call them. It's a, it's a training uh, for safety. Uh, it's a shell. It's a, a, a it's extra it's padding. A, yeah, it's a padding over the head <laughs> to sustain the impact that they have during practices. So he yeah. bought, I don't know, 40 of those, I yeah. think, for the kids, and it's just great. And unfortunately, we still had a lot of concussions, but you know, it's football. But I mean, 
I'm convinced he's doing whatever he can. He's doing a fantastic job. Tremendous leadership. All of our coaches. That concludes Mike's report. Thank you very much. That concludes my report as well. All right, so next on the superintendent's report is the enrollment report as of October 11th, 2022. Um, and as you all are aware, the October 1 enrollment data is very important as it drives our fiscal year, um, <coughs> upcoming fiscal year budget and assessments. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, so our enrollment as of 10 11 22 um, was 1215 um, I will note that we did add a column um, to the enrollment report and that is through age 22 um, our um, age you know, graduate through 22 students were part of the grade 12 enrollment and past reports and we disaggregated that so it's a separate column. Um, NESDEF was anticipating um, 1201 for our own enrollment for um, this year and if we subtract the age through age 22 and the others we're at um, 1199 so very close um, and I'll just note that we are um, projecting an enrollment decrease over the next several years, um, and that, that is trending um, as NESDEC has projected. So if there are no questions, also in your report is the FY23 monthly general fund expenditure report, and the FY23 statement of <coughs> revenue, and Becky will provide an overview. So as of September 30th, we had $1.3 million remaining on the bottom line. 5.15 percent. Um, we're trending closely to where we were last year at this time where we had 1.5 million or 6.23 percent. Um, the one line item in particular that we are really keeping a close eye on is our electricity costs. Unfortunately our contract for electricity expires in December um, and so we are working collaboratively with the town of Northborough and with Constellation Energy um, to secure a new contract um, for the future. Uh, we are looking though at rate hikes. You are all hearing what's happening on the news. Um, so that is something that we have factored into this projection. Um, but the good thing is, is that we are seeing benefit of the solar panels that are on the, um, on the roof of the school. Um, just for an example, last month, um, in total we used 145,000 kilowatt hours. And of those, um, we were able to use um, about 38,000 from the solar panels. Um, so it is providing some benefit in terms of the costs. Um, also, I just wanted to point out that there are a few line items in your budget that are showing as being over budget that we have um, created some corrections to. They were placed in like incorrect line items, and so we have since fixed that. But those line items are 2453 instructional hardware, 2455 instructional software, 4400 networking and telecommunications, 5300 copier lease, and then also 2309 ABA services. Um, but the finance team does continue to regularly um, look at these accounts. We are um, consistently like, looking at our annual um, projections, and so at this time I don't have any concerns with the FY23 operational budget. questions about the budget? So those were just Ms. Cameron's things that you had yes, to be yes. yeah. If you remember last year when we were preparing the budget, some of the, we had created some new line items to align with DESE, oh. and so people are still in their old, yeah. using the old account. So, um, so yes. that's something that I'm... Okay. I that. get it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. okay. um, uh, so so we need a vote on this uh, to be accepted until audited. Yes. <laughs> so moved. Joan. Second. Chris is closest to it. <laughs> um, all in favor of accepting until audited? Okay. And did you talk about the statement of revenue? Yeah. No. Yeah. Okay. All right. 
So in, during the month of September, we did receive our September 1st um, assessment from the town of Southborough. Um, you'll also notice that we are starting to see some of the student fees that um, we do collect on an annual basis coming in. Our athletic fees, as Mike um, has already mentioned, do reflect our fall sports um, enrollments as well as the gate receipts, which I understand have been very um, positive. Um, the other thing is the circuit breaker. I mentioned last month that we had kept the circuit breaker um, projection the same as last year. We still have not received our circuit breaker number yet from the state. Um, last month at the um, Madisville conference, um, Dusty did say that they we should expect it probably within the next month or so. So we are anticipating it soon. Um, it's my understanding that with the new Student Opportunity Act that they are still trying to um, come up with calculations since transportation is now included in that um, calculation. And this is year two of the SOA that they're implementing. Um, so it is still fairly new for them. So that number has remained the same. Um, but there's really, it was a quiet month for the most part in September. Uh, the state revenue has charter school tuition. That, so that's, I thought that's out. That's, that's, I'm sorry. Yeah. No, charter school, we do um, uh, We do have an assessment from the state right. from a student, yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. okay. Any questions on revenues? Uh, so we need a motion to accept until audited. So moved. Paul? A second. Second. Okay. Karen? All in favor? So the next item is the uh, FY24 budget priorities, and I believe um, a discussion on if there are any recommended changes for FY24. Mm -hmm. I think um, Paul had a, these are the areas that we as a school committee help um, direct the schools to look you know, what's important is we create a budget going forward and we approve a budget. And one of the major things coming up is the athletic complex. And I think an important discussion to have is it should that be added to uh, this budget priority list because we've been talking about it as a priority, but it's not necessarily, um, there's a creating sh uh, short and fund for the long-term capital for the high school, but it's not specific in here. So um, it was brought up that that should be a point of discussion. Um, Paul, do you want to talk to that? <coughs> sure. Um, I think tomorrow night we have a meeting with the Southboro um, CPA. CPC. CPC to get CPA funds. <laughs> but anyway, one of the questions we were asked is whether we put money aside for this project. And we have it because it's a capital <coughs> project. Unless you want to include all the money that's in that spreadsheet on maintenance have to spend if we don't do this. But anyway, I thought it would be good if we could at least say you know, it's one of our budget priorities and just vote on it. So that's one. And as Sean said, I think you know, it's, it's a big ticket item and I think it ought to be on our list of priorities. So should it be a priority or like part of the initiative piece of it? I think that's up for discussion, right? So the way I always envision things is, is it X or is it teachers? <laughs> because that's basically what the, is the bulk of the budget. So if we're going to prioritize this project, are we going to prioritize it in our operational budget? Like are we going to, or is it just going to be in the capital budget? Because because these priorities to me are kind of like how we prioritize allocating you know, our big, huge budget as opposed to, because this is going to, I mean, how much is this project? Seven million. I mean, to me, it's a one-year thing. It's one, unless it doesn't pass. <coughs> but I, I was thinking something wording along the lines of work with the towns of North and South Carolina to fund the athletic field complex. To get them to fund it. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, two, yeah. Two things. I would, I, the second to the last bullet for the creating fund, a short and long term capital plan for the high school. Right. I 
think we should have some goals that specific, specifically called out the athletic complex. And I agree this is not going to <coughs> be part of our operational budget. It is part of our capital <coughs> plan. Mm -hmm. um, and I just, on a side note, um, when we are asked, you know, do we have any money that we're contributing to this project, I think we also need to remind um, the townsfolk that we did bring for a proposal to create a capital stabilization fund mm -hmm. that has not been passed and approved. Therefore, we have no mechanism to mm -hmm. establish funds for any type of capital project mm -hmm. at this point. Mm -hmm. So, um, during a town meeting, though, would, if it's not in the operational budget, would it be another article? It'd be a one article, correct. Okay. Good. So, I think <coughs> I, just, I just, I mean, since it's just, it's just it's since it's a budget priority for 2024, putting it under a bulk a line, I and mean, you can take it off the following year. I like the idea of, I mean, I'd like the idea of putting it as a, basically a subcategory under the capital plan for high school, specifically. I think that's, that's a reasonable, I think that's reasonable, and I certainly agree that it's separate. I mean, if we're talking about looking at a budget that has to be reduced at some point, you basically wind up skipping over to the capital piece anyway. Um, but it is, it is something that's important for the school district going forward. So understanding that it's at least on our radar and it is a priority for us. Um, but knowing that, yes, if it came down to, granted it's separate, but um, if it came down to um, eliminating teachers and choosing an academic, you know, losing academics over athletics, I don't think any of us would ever say, you know, let's go with athletics over academics and what we're able to offer students here. But it is on our radar. <coughs> Um, I su also support the commentary about adding a support um, full wording and uh, suggestion is because my recollection from the last meeting it was made very clear to the committee that the facilities as they currently are are not safe. They're, they've been, um, they've been maintained as long as they can but they're no longer safe for athletes. I think that should get in here and that's why it's a priority. We're talking about athlete safety. Yeah, I mean, I, I'll just add that I think the language we've been using is it's really at its end of life. You know, it's, it's, um, it's no longer, you know, we've maximized the use out of you know, the current context. Um, I would just agree that putting in there, it, this is a public document where we're saying what's important to us. And I, I think going back to saying, like, if we had a mechanism um, such as a stabilization fund, we could even put more money forward uh, to it, but it's important to us, and it's important to the to, to the athletes and to the people who come here and um, other schools, you know, where, um, so it's important for the safety. I think it's good to be articulated. As far as the wording, do we have to do that now, or can we, um, unless somebody has some wording, um, I don't think it needs to be voted this evening. I think it's, it's conceptually, if the committee agrees that this is something um, it would like to move forward, we can work on the word and, and uh, bring it back at the November meeting. I don't, don't think it prohibits us from the work we need to do in terms of the budget process. Uh, the budget priorities that are there are what you're going to use to drive the budget process anyways. Right? Is the comfort, uh, I mean, just to, taking the temperature, we're comfortable with that voting on it another time. Yeah. 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 So also in your packet is the FI24 budget calendar. Um, so we um, are documenting all the key milestone events and dates. And I'll just note that we do have a um, meeting coming up next week, which is the capital planning subcommittee meeting. So it'll be another opportunity to talk about uh, capital plan priorities for fiscal year 24 and moving forward. I thought the operating budget meeting on home was in scary. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. It's a treat. <laughs> if you have a conflict, let, let me know. <laughs> uh, Sure, so um, so I do want to provide a brief presentation of, about the athletic complex project. 
um, review some of the reasons why we're moving forward with the project, and then give you an update of some of the work that's happened since our last meeting. So. So again, I just wanted to kind of review the why and the master plan. So in terms of the master plan, um, the goal is to replace the track, um, replace the stadium field with the turf surface, um, replace the grandstand and lights, um, install a multi-purpose field with a turf surface, replace the tennis course, and install an amphitheater. So that's the scope of the project. Um, and again, this is the, the master plan, um, an overview and visual of uh, what we hope to have um, be the athletic complex in future years. And I'll just point out um, the amphitheater is in the um, bottom left-hand corner of the software. Is it pointing to like the audience to be? <laughs> Sorry. So that's a natural, there's actually a, a hill. Um, so it sits up, up on the hill and then okay. it sits up below. So just an overview of the project of the Y. So the current conditions, the uh, end of the use of life is um, how we describe the current stadium. The tennis courts were installed in 2004, um, significant cracking. Um, we have patched and resurfaced many of the courts. Uh, but again, they continue to um, crack. And then again, they're far beyond the life expectancy, which is about 18 years. In terms of the field, um, the field was not renovated from the school uh, renovation that took place in 2004, it was top seated. Um, the spectator stands were also not um, updated in 2004. They are original to 1994, and they are not uh, ADA compliant. And, um, also, in terms of the access of the field, so we do have to rest our fields and um, we cannot accommodate all teams and groups uh, for use due to the conditions and stress of the, the use. And I'll also add that the lighting is original to 1994 um, and many of our uh, sporting teams cannot play on the field under the lights, uh, for example, lacrosse, just because it's unsafe and doesn't meet uh, the safety standard. In terms of the track, the track was also installed in 1994. Um, if you have observed the track, there's heavy patching. Um, we see puddling, as you can see evidence in the picture. Um, the track does not meet MIAA standards, and um, we are not a lot, uh, able to host track events. Um, and the useful life of the track is 18 years. Um, and we have resurfaced, um, has been resurfaced one time, and patched and repaired. Um, and quite honestly, it looks like a patchwork quilt <coughs> at the time. Um, and it is really on an unsafe surface. So steps that we've taken uh, since the last school committee meeting. So um, we have provided citizen information. Um, we had a presence at Applecast and Heritage Today. We also launched a website. Um, Becky has consulted with our financial advisor to do some financial uh, projections. We've also convened the financial subcommittee of the uh, Athletic Complex Project Committee, um, and they've begun to create some financial models. Um, we had a joint meeting with the chairs of the Athletic Project Complex Committee, which is Paul Desmond and David Roman, the town administrators and the town finance directors. It was a very helpful um, meeting, making sure that we were all on the same page. We've also submitted CPC applications to both communities, North Pro and South Pro. And um, we met with the North Pro permit, Permitting Board, with Gale Associates, a cons Conservation Town plan and Planner, and Town Engineering in preparation for making sure we have proper permitting and making sure we know what the expectations are. The next steps, um, so actually tomorrow evening, um, 
we're meeting with a CPC committee in Southborough to present our, um, our ask uh, to the Southboro CPC. We have not scheduled a meeting for the Northboro CPC, but they do have our application and we anticipate to hear from them shortly. Um, finalizing the school committee FY24 budget priorities, um, which again, is a conversation that took place this evening. Um, and we're convening the regional capital subcommittee next week. Um, we continue to work very closely with Gale Associates on completing the 100% design cost estimate and working with Gale moving through the permitting process uh, in hopes to have the preparation of the bid materials. Um, and we do anticipate going out for bid um, pre-town meeting, uh, so we have everything lined up pending funding. Uh, we need to meet with the town boards, so capital, select boards, financial advisory committees, and we're um, drafting the warrant article language. Most of this work will take place in the months of November and December. Um, the project committee is really looking at doing a communication community <coughs> forums in the months of January, February, and March leading up to town meeting so that people have accurate and um, good information so they can make an informed decision on, on whether they support the project or not. And I'll turn it over to uh, Becky to talk a little bit about um, the financial breakdown and then some <coughs> other So this breakdown um, is based on Gale Associates' 90% um, design estimates. Um, you can see right now the estimated project cost is just over $7.5 million. Um, we've also asked them if they could break out those items that are part of the project that are eligible for the CPC funding and then those items that are not eligible. Um, CPC will not <coughs> fund um, at artificial turf fields. Um, and then we are also asking uh, the CPC Commission in Boston to look over our plans just to um, weigh in on um, the various elements just to make sure that we are, our thinking is aligned with theirs. Um, so right now we are estimated, estimating eligible funding to be about six million and then the remaining amount would not be eligible. Can, so, can you say, um, just because sure. we use acronyms all the okay. time, CPC, just in case people watching are Sure, so that's the Community Preservation Commission. Um, okay. Thank you for pointing that out. Um, so I've also given you the percentage, um, as you know, in the regional agreement, we do look back on the past four years. We take the average four-year um, enrollment numbers as of October 1st. So this does take into consideration the October 1st, um, 2022 um, enrollment numbers. So right now, this is what we would be looking at for the two towns in terms of what they would be responsible for. And I've just broken it out based on what is eligible and what is not eligible um, for CPC funding. We do plan to request from North Borough 1.2 million and then um, from South Borough 746 or so. Um, thousand um, dollars towards this project um, and again this is just a breakdown of what is considered to be CPC eligible um, so there are general conditions um, that includes any of the insurances the cost of the general contractor um, erosion control um, the track and football fields those components that are not related to the artificial turf um, tennis courts, and then the same thing with the JV football fields, those things that are not eligible for, um, I'm sorry, that are not artificial turf related. Um, and so the subtotal is about $5 million, um, and we have built in about a 20% contingency. Um, so we are looking at the $6 million total for um, eligible CPC funding. And then it is obviously much smaller on the non, um, which the general conditions would be anything related to the artificial turf again, and the same thing on the track and the, the football field and the JV football field. Um, so that's about 1.25 million um, with a contingency of 20% built in. And um, as Greg mentioned, I have reached out to Unibank, to our financial advisor, these numbers, I will tell you, were requested at the beginning of September. So the 3% is based on September 9th um, interest rate. Um, the Fed did raise rates, I believe, um, within days of us requesting this information. Um, and this 
projection is also based off of Yale Associates 50% cost estimate. So I have reached out to them to get a more um, up-to-date figure for us based on the new interest rates and then also on the more accurate um, estimates. Um, so we have um, asked them just to run, we ran a number of different scenarios. However, this is a 10-year um, and it is a level debt service. So each year the um, debt service would be very um, uh, close to, um, for the town so that there would not be much variability. Um, but you can see at the end of the day, the North Row assessment would be about 5.6 million and South Rose would be 3.3 um, or so. And this is without any of the CP funds being, CPC funds being utilized. And then I think the next one just shows um, if we were to use the CPC funds, what that would um, look like. Um, so it is obviously that makes an impact on the overall bottom line for both communities. Again, that concludes the presentation. <laughs> we'd be happy to answer any questions. I have a question uh, related to CPC funding, and that would be um, I'm pretty sure when I've been to, well, when I've been to Northborough Town Meeting that this, whenever a CPC project comes before town meeting that it, it's its own separate warrant article. Does that mean that would we be able to include the CPC funding as part of our warrant article? We need to uh, amend the warrant article on the floor. Okay. All right. So we would ask for that full amount and then amend to reduce by whatever we have for We probably have a couple scenarios ready. <coughs> Man, that's why it was so much fun. <laughs> <laughs> and what about like fundraising and the boosters? Yeah, so. Um, the Athletic Complex Project Committee has talked about fundraising. Um, I think what the position we're taking is that we're not going to fundraise our way out of the size of a project. Um, that some of the larger potential um, donors or sponsors really want to see this move forward to a warrant article before they'll even consider um, potentially donating um, a portion of the funding of this project. Um, I think that the information we received is that it's been talked about so long, they don't believe that it's being taken seriously, and they want some evidence that it is. I think, I, so I think as far as like suffer goes, I think there's gonna have to be buy-in, and I could be wrong, but I feel like some people feel like since Algonquin's in Northborough, that the access to the fields for South Borough isn't really there. Mm -hmm. So that may be part of a buy-in at our town meetings because, you know. Yeah, I mean, I think it's really important. Um, it's extremely really important. A community asset for right. both communities, not just North Borough and also South Borough. Um, the tennis courts, the track, the amphitheater, the access for youth sport organizations in both communities. Mm -hmm. You know, I think those are the the why um, it's important for South I Carolina. I think like the only know. thing that we came over here for was um, girls softball. And it's only because it was two town. Yeah. And then fields and then lacrosse wasn't here with someplace else. I don't know where youth soccer stands, but I know like baseball the two towns have merged for Little League. Soccer Where does baseball play now? Well, they still play the same field, but the, it's no longer South Pearl Little League and North Pearl Little League. Oh, really? to Algonquin. Sure. I think the, I think the challenge too is we had to rest our fields. So uh, right. you know, a grass field, you can't you know you have to rotate. <coughs> we can't have youth sports on the weekends playing on our field with, with grass. So, but I, but, I, but I think the residents of South Pearl always assume that North Pearl is using it, even though you're resting them. Do you know what I mean? So it's just yeah. It's just getting that across to people yeah. and selling it to them. Yeah. No, I think that is really important. And the other question I have too is, um, so we have a field in South Road, the 911 field, that was just, <coughs> I believe, it was redone recently. Mm -hmm. Were there any town funds that, or was that privately? So if, if we're saying that CPC funds can't be used for turf fields, how is that? 
don't recall if they use CPC funds, but actually the CPC funds, correct me if I'm wrong, Becky, but they can't be used for the term itself. Mm -hmm. Okay. Underneath is okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <coughs> I imagine. All right. But I think that one, they just, there was a, an article and they just raised money. It was like 600000 and it wasn't a complete review like this. That, that was, I think, the term and maybe some so, okay. structure. I think also we've had preliminary conversations around, you know, what is the long-term maintenance of these turf fields? And, you know, we we will potentially have more opportunity for facilities rentals of these fields and making sure that we create some type of funding mechanism from the facilities use to go into some type of um, revolving fund for the sole purpose. We make like a budget, like a yeah, line. Yeah, the sole purpose of maintaining these fields for long term. For sponsorships too, yeah. yeah. And sponsorships. So we'll provide more information as we continue to move forward. And that concludes the superintendent's report for the committee. Oh, this, this vacancy update. So we are um, still not 30 days out from the posting, so there's still an active posting. I did check with um, Cheryl Lefty to see if we had any interested parties in um, competing for the vacancy. At this point, we do not. So I think the you mean there's only one. So there's a met, you know, the message is that you know there is an open seat in the regional on the regional school committee in Southboro, and that we encourage uh, folks to apply for that <coughs> that seat. It would be nice to have more than one candidate uh, to introduce. Or it would be nice to have one candidate. I'm going to ask you to put that idea. Yeah, it was in your weekly. Uh, uh, it's been posted on the um, cable access. Uh, yeah, is it on like my stuff for us? My, um, I think it has, but I think we'll, we'll do another uh -huh. communication campaign. I think when I saw it, it was the community advocate at the time we showed it. Put on Instagram and do something where other people. Can we raise all these assignments? So the only the only um, comment I have is that the um, there's one committee, um, the student advisory. I believe we only have one person. I believe that's <coughs> Kathleen right now. I'm trying to think of trying to find it on the list. Um, yeah. It's a very bottom. Um, Thank you. So the student advisory committee, um, we are convening next month, um, and Kathleen is the sole member. But it'd be nice probably to have. When do they meet? Um, we're going to meet five thirty. Before the school committee. What do they do? Wonderful things. <laughs> <laughs> they usually set a couple goals. We um, listen a lot. Yeah, listen. It's a, I think it's a chance to connect with the school, the student, um, school council, the student government, and, and to hear directly from them. <laughs> Pre pandemic, I think they took. Uh, student advisor took up uh, student health and well-being um, and they helped collect data with stress, homework, mm -hmm. sleep, mm -hmm. um, really provided that the committee to get data. In the past we've discussed the finals schedule and, uh, and who gets to pick finals if you have a certain grade and they were very opinionated. <laughs> <laughs> But we haven't done that. We haven't had me like this in a long time, right? Mm -hmm. A couple of years. It's correct. Yeah. Is mm -hmm. it once a month? It's just once. Uh, it's a few times a year, so. I'll, I'll do it. So, yeah. It's every <laughs> other month. It's supposed to be. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, Sean, there's just one correction, um, and that's the delays onto the end. But Education Foundation it says inactive. That okay. should be active. Uh, 
Do you have an update on that? That wasn't yes, that I just. Did. <laughs> That's why I know it's that. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, do you want to um, talk about that now? Do you want me to? May we on to that part? Um, I think we're all set with the assignments, right? <coughs> That's not quite. No. no. I think, at least this is what I was told when I was chair, was the liaison to selectmen should be the chair. Oh. <laughs> yes, that's true. Yeah, no, that's true. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> if you can make that change and make me aware of where I need to be when. <laughs> Never amounted to anything. That's how my days go. Just somebody tells me to. Okay, thank you. Uh, any, any other interesting things? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, I think now would be a time to talk about those. Okay. So I, I am the liaison to the Northborough Education Foundation, and uh, we have monthly meetings. And the September meeting um, was held, and also at that time in September, the grants were awarded and um, Superintendent Martin was there and gave a, a speech and a nice uh, handing out of the uh, grants. And I just wanted to report very quickly on the five grants that ARHS had received. The first one was Ancient Healers, Modern Medicine, and the Power of Connection. And that grant is going to support a new social studies course here. It's going to be called that same title. Uh, the other one was a ARHS ELD Listen, Listen Wise podcast. It's a year subscription to the Listen Wise program for the English language development classrooms to support the listening, reading, and speaking skills of our English learners. The third one was a unified art project, and this is going to provide resources for several collaborative art projects, bringing students of various artistic towns together to create pieces for the school community, which we'll probably see at different times. Um, another one is a Titan Townhouse, and this is one uh, to teach students how to better prepare themselves for life after high school. And um, on this one, they're going to be doing a mock apartment that students will use to practice their <laughs> skills in a setting that will support and enhance various life skills to generalize into the home and community environments. This space will be named the Titan Townhouse. And the last one is World Atlases. The world's changing all the time. And it's new atlases that will give teachers the ability to access the newest resources and most updated maps. And Algonquin was very well uh, getting the grants. I think mean, they've been a majority of the grants. They did a great job. So please thank the teachers for taking their time. And also the, uh, the teacher who is the liaison also to that foundation that speaks us up at often at the uh, at the meeting. So thank you very much for yeah. teachers and wonderful wide selection of grants. That they yeah, I was sad I couldn't make it to that, but um, Assistant Principal McGowan. I didn't say it's long. Thank you. For a future uh, um, item on our agenda, I would like a tour of the Titan <laughs> <laughs> Things that we could update our houses on, right? It's actually interesting because, um, on a side note, like my two older boys just moved out, mm -hmm. and last night we went to see their apartments for the first time, so that probably could have helped. <laughs> 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 Although they did say, since it's like not college, that yeah. they're keeping it much cleaner. <laughs> um, okay, so policy distribution so it's just the distribution of that yes yeah, so I think this is important to um, the distribution of capital stabilization <coughs> fund policy so as we move our work forward as a committee to continue to advocate for establishing um, this fund um, this is one of I think prerequisites that was requested of the committee for the town of South Pearl, and I think it's just the policy in general so that's now in there. Uh, this is the second opportunity for public comment in our meeting. Is there anyone in public who wants to speak public? Okay. 
Personnel distribution, distribution of personnel. So in your packet is the um, October 19th uh, personnel report. So a few um, appointments to our educational support professional positions. Those are the positions that we are having the most full time recruiting folks uh, for. So it's nice to see that um, we continue to fill those positions with high quality people. Are, are, um, are you fully staffed now? Or Sean, are you fully staffed? We are not, we're not far off. The ESP population sometimes, there are fluctuations that we're mm -hmm. not totally aware of, but we're very, very close. Uh, communications to the committee. I did receive an email uh, in the past month from a community member parent asking about the video. Um, about where videos are available at each meeting. And there was a glitch last April, I believe, um, with some sound, but they are all um, available on our website, on our school committee website. There's a video link, and then they're uploaded uh, within about a month's time of each meeting. And they were all posted and organized by the time of North Girls Cable Access. Is that correct? You have that correct? Okay. Uh, approval of bills. I, do I say anything? I think we can. Yes. I think Kathy and Kathleen are the two. Great. Okay. <laughs> I don't need more. Thank you. Uh, and agenda items for next month. So enrollment projections. Is that just for the coming year or kind of like for the coming years? For the upcoming year of the school year, the budget. Okay. Uh, and then we'll start our budget discussion and then the fine arts, <coughs> the performing arts will present. Any other questions or comments for that? Or questions for that meeting or agenda items? Okay, so we will move. Uh, we're not ending the meeting, but we're, I need a motion to move to executive session. Right? Correct. I move that we uh, go into executive session with no intent to return to open session to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining due to the chair's determination that a discussion regarding this matter in an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the position of the committee with no intent to return to open meeting. I said it twice. Huh. <laughs> <laughs> I agree, agree. Definitely. Second. <laughs> All, uh, okay. All in favor? It's a roll call. Almost got out of here. Uh, Paul? Yes. Kathy? Yes. Karen? Yes. Joe? Yes. 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 y